Um, it is my distinct honor to have Melissa here with us for, for JROS 2020. Um, Dr. Melissa Handel is the director of the Center for Data to Health, um, also known as CD2H, um, at Oregon Health and Science University, um, which is an NIH-funded institute. Um, she's the director of translational data science at Oregon State University. She's an elected fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association. Uh, her background's in translational science with a focus over the past decade on the development of ontologies, which Gully and I were talking about before you joined, um, ontologies, semantic engineering technologies, and open science infrastructure programs. Um, Dr. Handel's vision is to weave together healthcare systems, basic science research, and patient-generated data through development of data integration technologies and innovative data capture strategies. Um, she co-leads the Monarch Initiative, an international consortium dedicated to utilizing model organism genotype phenotype data, um, deep phenotyping, and graph-based integration techniques to improve rare disease diagnosis. She also co-leads the NCATS data tran uh, translator, which aims to integrate hundreds of data sources for mechanism and drug discovery. The CD2H is tasked with coordinating informatics across 60 clinical and translational science award institutes, or CTSA, if you're in, if you're in uh, the US and is focused on implementation of cloud and information architecture, clinical data model interoperability, and precision medicine-focused terminology development. Dr. Handel is a co-lead for the GA4GH clinical and phenotype work stream, where she supports cross-disciplinary international teams, development of standards for clinical genetics and rare disease and cancer, and improving access to data across the world. Um, as you know, at the core of what JROS is about is are many of these core issues when it comes to not only data, uh, but also interoperability, integrations of systems, and really bringing those together to help um, you know, transform the ways in which we can serve patient populations and broader um, individuals in society. So Melissa, welcome to JROS 2020. We're super excited to have you here. And with that, Melissa, I will hand it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's, it's really um, a great pleasure to be here today. And I really hope that um, this talk will inspire you to think about how bringing together the people, the data, and the software architecture from across many communities um, can be used for, for public benefit. And it's really in the face of the pandemic that we've seen such wonderful insights in that regard uh, across so many parts of the world. And, and so this, this may be just yet another one, but it's a particularly interesting one, I think, from the, um, uh, from the uh, joint roadmap for open science perspective, as well as from the perspective of collaboration and action. So I feel especially honored to be here today. Okay, so I'm gonna move all of your beautiful faces over and see if I can't get the presentation mode to go. Can you all still see my slides? And this lasts until 7 p.m. Perfect. And we'll move we'll okay, the other participants. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, uh, a national initiative. Um, uh, the title of the talk is Revealing the Secrets of COVID 19, Analyzing the Nation's Clinical Data Together. Um, and I think this, again, it, it really reveals some of the, the challenges and potentially some of the solutions. Um, to working on sensitive data across institutions and leveraging open science um, techniques as well as um, sort of vision and best practices uh, in the context of working on sensitive data. And if you're interested, the slides are actually posted um, at that uh, bit.ly and you can also tweet me if you'd like. Okay, so as you all know, the pandemic highlights many urgent needs. We need, it's a brand new disease. We don't know anything about it. We're learning quickly, but we still, there's a huge amount that we don't know. Um, and so we have, um, we have a great need to develop new algorithms for diagnosis, triage, predictive algorithms, to, do, to perform drug discovery and pharmacogenetics, multimodal analytics. How do we use our nation's collective EHR data, imaging, genomics data? Um, identify interventions that would reduce disease severity, 
um, identify best practices for resource allocation, which unfortunately, um, you know, are, are, are still an issue uh, in many places. Um, and to coordinate our research efforts to maximize our efficiency and our reproducibility. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, so many people are spending their scientific and, and computational lives um, trying to help um, work on the pandemic together. But it's, it's also, you know, we don't want to duplicate our efforts. We want to work together and maximize our, our efficiency. So all of these things require the creation of a comprehensive clinical data set fast. So um, some say this is an African proverb, although when I looked it up, I couldn't find the source. So it's an unsighted source, but you I'm sure you've all heard it. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, but in this case, we need to do both. We really, really, really need to do both if we're going to combat um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So introducing uh, what we call the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or N3C. Um, it's called the Cohort Collaborative because it takes a village to get all the institutions and all the people in those institutions to create a shared um, clinical cohort that is a collection of patient data from across the nation. So before I kind of dive into the details of um, the N3C, I wanted to kind of highlight three aspects um, that I'll sort of mention throughout the theme of the talk. And these are kind of the three areas of barriers to, um, to reusability of data and usability of data. And this comes from, these come from some uh, an older res a response uh, to a request for information that we wrote uh, that's also at that bit.ly called FAIR TLC, which really looks at what are some of the sort of metrics and, and you know, big sticky issues that relate to one's ability to actually reuse data. And those have to do with traceability and reproducibility, um, specifically relating out to evidence, provenance, and attribution, um, often traceability and licensure. Um, so how data, data and software tools are licensed go hand in hand. The licensing is often used as a way to get credit because we don't have other means to do so. Um, licensing and approvals. So making sure that data and software's uh, license are clearly stated, that they're comprehensive and non-negotiated -negoti or not requiring legal intervention, that those license information is accessible and doesn't avoid, and that um, doesn't avoid restrictions on, on reuse. Um, and that of course the HIPAA and IRB regulatory uh, compliance is, is achieved. And then finally, that the data is and, and software tools and people are connected with identifiers and standard data models and terminologies and concept alignment and clinical data elements in the case of the N3C. So um, just a little bit of background on some of the research landscape that, that we have in hand when it comes to clinical data. So there, there exist many clinical institutions that have been working in these research networks um, where, and this is um, this person here on the, on the left, where inside each of those institutions, the clinical data is placed within a common data model that can then be queried remotely. Um, and the answers to those questions are sent back. And in this federated model, we, we, we ask specific questions. So for example, how is the time on the ventilator impacted by a given drug? And this question is then sent to all the data network partners who then um, query their, their standard, uh, their data that's placed in that standard model. And then that uh, answer is sent back here, reduced by one day or reduced by three days at the two different institutions. And this information can be reported back can be averaged and other kinds of statistics and uh, analytical methods can be performed upon it. But the, this, is, this is fairly standard um, in the context of how clinical research networks work across institutions today. Um, and there are many different um, clinical research networks. The, the reason for that is because these clinical data are sensitive. They live behind clinical data firewalls. But what this doesn't necessarily allow is more discovery-oriented questions that are really important in the context of a new disease, such as COVID-19. And so if we want central analytics where we can ask questions such as, in patients under age 60, which factors are most predictive of severe outcomes so that we can care for those patients differently um, given that fact um, in the context of their um, clinical encounter? And then we can work together to collaboratively build, test, and refine algorithmic classifiers and identify novel associations that could also not only provide 
um, care um, guidelines, but also can reveal underlying mechanisms that can help identify drug targets. And so in this case, the data actually resides in, in a central secure enclave. So what we'd really want, we'd really like to just take all this data out of these institutions and put it all in one place where we can run large um, analytical um, types of methods such as machine learning uh, and other more advanced um, technologies. The other thing to note here is that these data um, particularly live behind these clinical firewalls aren't very accessible to the community. Um, many people who might be expert at machine learning, maybe they work for one of our big social network companies or, or um, you know, Amazon or some other you know, company that does a lot of analytics. They don't, they don't have access to clinical data, but they might be some of the nation's best experts in machine learning. Simultaneously, we have experts who um, are really experts in, you know, clinical clinical data analytics in these uh, centralized models, and they don't necessarily have access to experts in machine learning. So what we'd really like to do is create an environment where many different uh, experts in different aspects of addressing how we analyze these data can actually work together. Um, and so by centralizing these data, it's actually possible to answer different kinds of questions, but only if we work together and actually address all of those three points that I mentioned about data being connected, licensed, and traceable and reproducible. So what kinds of questions can N3C actually address? So um, questions uh, such as, do some therapies work better than others by region or by demographics? Can we compare local rare clinical observations with national occurrences? We see a lot of rare observations in one hospital that aren't really rare when you look across the nation. Um, and how those patients fare on particular therapies or care regimes is really important to know. Can we predict who might have severe outcomes if they have COVID-19? Can, uh, can we predicate a, acute renal failure in a COVID positive patients? Who might need a ventilator because of lung failure? Why are some people asymptomatic? And for kids, can we compare rates of infectivity before and after school reopenings? And what are some of the social determinants of health uh, that are risk factors for mortality? And how can those be used um, uh, in combination with other machine learning uh, algorithms to help reveal um, uh, key risk factors and key care regimes for, um, uh, for all patients? So um, this is sort of a high level overview of the data flow. Um, and I especially want to attribute the four clinical research data networks um, and their clinical data, their common data models that we have really uh, worked together in partnership with these different uh, institutions and with these different research communities in order to build the N3C. And those are the ACT network, the Odyssey community, the PCORNet community, uh, and the commercial partner Trinetics. And so these four organizations um, have really worked together to help us figure out how to harmonize all the data from as many institutions as possible. And so the data flow goes like this. So across the nation, there are many clinical institutions, each with their own data. The data is in one of these four models. Um, and these uh, institutions, uh, we've harmonized those models. Um, and in harmonizing those models, we can place all the data into one target model. And that target model there's a lot of data quality issues, not just um, because it comes from all four models, but also just because institutionally different institutions um, structure and populate these research data warehouses differently. That environment is in a secure environment at the National Institutes of Health, um, where no data can uh, have any egress from the system whatsoever. It's one of the most secure um, cloud infrastructures in the nation. And within this context, however, because of its security, we're able to provide access to a wide variety of users um, and people can work together to ask important questions uh, of these data in that context. We also have a project to try to generate synthetic data. Well, we do have generated synthetic data um, that we hope we have not yet uh, released it for download, but we, we hope that the um, synthetic data will be available for public download. Um, and that would allow even more people to be able to leverage the, the wealth of information that comes from the N3C. So today, um, I, I don't, uh, I don't have anyone that's told me this, that this isn't the case, but I believe this is the largest clinical limited data set in US history. Um, and we have 44 sites that have 
um, already deposited, uh, so 44 clinical institutions that have already deposited data into the N3C pipeline. Um, and we have um, 73 sites that have signed legal agreements with NIH. So we're uh, roughly a little over half of the promised data from across the na nation thus far. And we are actively working to recruit new sites from, uh, especially from rural and other disadvantaged community hospitals and networks um, so that we can make sure that the uh, N3C is representative of, of all Americans. Um, so the data use and privacy rules, um, I just wanted to go over this because uh, it's really important to recognize the sens sensitive nature of these data um, and then how to make you aware of like how hard it is to actually deploy some of the open science principles and, and tools um, in this context. And so uh, the goal of the data use agreement is privacy protection, to, but also to promote broad access. You can only use the data for COVID-related research. There is no re-identification of individuals or the data sources, so we've obfuscated the sources. Um, there's no download or capture of raw data, no screenshots, um, no downloads. Um, however, it is an open platform to all researchers. We also have really, uh, as I mentioned, really inc incredible security, which provides certain advantages that I'll get to later in the talk. But all activities in the N3C Enclave are recorded and can be audited. So we, we know where everybody was. We know who looked at somebody else's code. We know who lo looked at certain data. We know who was in the system on a given day. It's extremely well audited, as it must be in order to secure, to make sure that the data is absolutely secure so that we can provide access to uh, as many people as possible. Um, disclosure of the research results is required uh, to the N3C enclave, so the entire community can benefit from uh, rapid sharing of results. We have analytics providence and full reproducibility, as well as contributor attribution tracking, which is one of the great benefits that um, uh, is available when you track everybody's actions, you can also track all of their contributions. So these are the three different uh, data tier levels. Um, over there on the right is the limited data set. This is data. Um, so these are, these are just to be clear, these are electronic health record data with all of the tables of the electronic health record for these patients, but stripped of all of the um, identifiers called out in the HIPAA privacy rule, except for the dates and the zip codes. So for the pandemic, we obviously need dates and zip codes uh, for some types of analytics. Um, and you can see also um, that, you know, we are, uh, we are really working to provide uh, these different tiers so that we can maximize the access. So um, for example, only US academic or commercial research organizations are allowed to have access to that limited data set. Whereas the level two, the, the identified data set uh, is stripped of 17 direct identifiers um, with the longitudinal data date shifted to safeguard privacy. And that is available to any academic or commercial research organization worldwide. Um, the level three data requires an institutional review board um, act to access. So you need to prove that you need those dates and zip codes in order to do your analysis um, to the data access committee in order to get access to that level of data. Otherwise, you're looking at the de-identified data. Um, and then we also have the synthetic data, which has the broadest access. Um, and as I mentioned, we uh, eventually plan to make these data um, downloadable if we can um, validate their um, de-identification status. So this is um, the complexity of making, getting, making the arrangements with all the institutions to both contribute data as well as to use data. So, Institutions contributing data have an IRB, um, this is a reliance agreement with the Johns Hopkins University, um, and sign data transfer agreements, legal agreements with the National Institutes of Health. They submit their original limited data sets. These are the full EHR um, tables from those four clinical data models. Um, and then with that data goes into the NIH as the data steward um, of the data. So the data lives at it, within this uh, cloud enclave at NIH. Um, the data is harmonized by uh, a group of, of community contributors and overseen by the NIH IRB. Um, individuals, data users who are at an institution that has a data that has an institutional data use agreement, which is a different legal agreement that the institution signs with NIH to provision access for its members um, to the data, um, can then register. Um, to use the data and make a data use request, which involves an attestation to the user code of conduct, a data use state 
document and an uh, attestation of security training, as well as human subjects training documentation. It's a lot of hoops to jump through, but not so many considering the broad access that we're able to provide so long as you jump through those hoops saying that you will be a good citizen and use the, the data for, for public benefit. Um, and this goes to the data access committee that decides which access tier um, you've requested uh, matches the actual needs of the, of the project. And as I mentioned, if you need access to the limited data set, you do need a local institutional project specific IRB. Um, so as I mentioned to date, there are 72 uh, data transfer uh, signatories, so different, different types of institutions that are all submitting data. Um, one of the great uh, things I'll get to later in the talk is the um, wiring of information. This is live fed from our, from our Google Forms coming from the institutions, um, so it can be updated at, at any moment. Um, and it's, it's pretty fun to play around with the um, uh, various ways that you can connect uh, Google, GitHub, and a variety of other uh, tools and resources. Um, so again, um, as I mentioned, there are four common data models. Um, and these four models, uh, as I mentioned, are known as uh, common, uh, common data models. And they allowed us to also write a consistent computable phenotype that can be run with a few local changes at sites with one or more of these models. So this is just a reminder that, so each clinical institution populates these models differently, but we wanna understand which patient should we should select from that institution. We're not pulling every EHR record from that institution. We're, we're pulling records that match a specific set of characteristics um, that are designed for uh, COVID analytics. So um, to date, uh, um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, we have over 2 billion rows, so 2.6 million patients in the system. Um, that's 372 COVID-19 positive patients. So this gets after that, that phenotype that I mentioned. So we only some of the patients that we're pulling are COVID positive because obviously we need to have negative patients as well. And so we are matching these positive patients for things like demographics and age uh, in order to pull negative controls. Um, and this is just a, a high level overview of the age distribution. Uh, we do have children. Uh, we are really grateful that we're able to compare children and especially as we look over the longer time period as children mat matriculate out of um, the less than 18 age range, we'll still be able to track um, the characteristics over, over time. Um, and also it provides a, a key a component to um, look at the disease uh, in different age classes and the disease is manifested quite differently in, in children than it, than it is in adults. Um, so this is a, a description of that high level phenotype that I mentioned. Um, this is led by Emily Pfaff at University of North Carolina. Um, and so basically what, what it looks for is to try to select which patients we should include in the cohort. We look for patients with a positive COVID test, PCR or antibody, that sounds a lot easier uh, than it actually is. <laughs> um, this means that they, or that they have an ICD-10 code of, of um, a, a U07.1, or they have two or more COVID-like diagnosis codes, um, such as ARDS, pneumonia, et cetera, during the same encounter, but only on or prior to May before things got a little bit more uh, fleshed out in terms of how these things were documented in electronic health record. And each one of these patients is then demographically matched to two patients with a negative or equivocal COVID tests, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, based on demographics and age. And then each site securely sends these set of patients along with their longitudinal data, all the way dating back from uh, 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 January 1st, 2018 to the present uh, to N3C on a, on a regular basis. And each site uh, decides the frequency. Um, we will take any data we can get. And so if a site can send it once a week, that's terrific. If they can only send it once every few weeks, then, then that's just good enough. Um, uh, that does also lend itself to some, some challenges in analyzing the data, but um, we've done a pretty good job, I believe, with uh, documenting with our release notes some of the particular characteristics of each data set's uh, release, and it gets released weekly. Um, so on to the data harmonization issues. Um, even just figuring out uh, whether or not a patient is COVID pos positive for the same reason, like the same, whether or not it's an antibody test or a PCR test um, and the tests numbers have changed and things are um, diff recorded differently in different institutions. And this is just a really straightforward example, but 
it's important to note that this is going on for almost every aspect of the data. So here in hospital A, um, we have a patient. Uh, this patient has an identifier and a diagnosis code and a diagnosis date. But if you look at hospital B, um, this patient, both of these patients have COVID, um, but a single query would not would not capture that both of these patients had COVID. They have different diagnosis codes um, and they don't even represent date in the same way. We, we found that even, uh, even representing weight or height or, or BMI uh, is one of the most challenging things to actually um, get consistent across different sites. Um, so the reality is, is that uh, we don't have a lot of harmony in our, in our clinical data across the nation. Um, and, and this is one of the challenges is data quality um, and data missingness as well. So this is just an example of what that looks like. So each of the columns here on the right are different codes that are used to record asthma in different sites. So um, you can see just from looking at the sort of um, heterogeneity of this figure that different sites just simply use different codes to record asthma. So we need a way of reconciling um, the different representations coming from the different sites. And so to do that, we create code sets, which sort of have the same meaning, um, but link different codes that are used in the different hospitals uh, to represent the same thing here, asthma. And so this really requires a whole lot of uh, particular uh, aspects relating to traceability and reproducibility. Like we need to know which site used which code. Um, and to, in order to validate this code set, we need to know, we need to be able to share this information. It needs to be approved by a clinical expert. Um, and it needs to be uh, connected uh, to other codes that might be related to asthma, for example. Okay, so on to the analytical enclave itself. Um, and uh, this enclave is, as I mentioned, deployed in a secure cloud environment uh, at NIH. Um, and the environment itself allows um, the discoverability of data as well as other assets, such as the code sets that I mentioned, but also all kinds of software artifacts and mapping files and other knowledge objects. Um, it has a standard suite of, of um, uh, code packages such as R and Python. Um, it allows you to build analytical workflows and you can scale um, using a variety of, of services. Um, there are a variety of tools that have been deployed within this environment and we're going to come back to the challenges of deploying tools in this environment in a minute. Um, but much of the Odyssey uh, data quality tool stack has been deployed for evaluating the harmonization aspects and quality. Um, the NCAT, um, which is the uh, institute that funds this work, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. Um, and they, uh, uh, that's a different project called the Translator, which integrates many hundreds of different um, uh, data sources, uh, public data sources for mechanistic discovery, including the literature, um, into knowledge graphs. And so these knowledge graphs have been deployed within the system as well. The LEAF cohort discovery tool, um, which is actually quite challenging to, to deploy where it is underway uh, because it requires a read write functionality and we can't, and no data can actually leave the enclave. So the read write functions are um, kind of challenging to deploy this, this code base in this context. Um, we have the MedTagger tool, which allows clinical notes to be um, mined locally and then pushed uh, as structured de-identified data along with the electronic health record data. And then the MD clone um, synthetic data en uh, generation engine. We also have a project underway to perform hashing using an honest broker to reconnect data that comes to, from the patients and goes to other different kinds of data repositories, such as clinical trials data, imaging data, or genomics data because we in medicine like to take all the data about a patient and split it all up and ship it off to all kinds of different places where it's really challenging to put the patient back together again. But in the face of the new disease, we're going to try to do that with some of these data modalities. So in this environment, we have a secure, reproducible, transparent, versioned, provenanced, attributed, and shareable analytics platform on patient level electronic health record data. So um, this is just another uh, diagram showing um, the chasm of semantic despair, a term uh, coined by my uh, co-lead on this program, Dr. Chris Schutt. Um, and that's me at the bottom of the chasm, uh, trying to connect basic research data to clinical data uh, using a variety of tools and algorithms and ontologies. Um, and so one of the goals of the program is to really bring together mechanistic scientists uh, with clinical informaticians. 
Um, and so this is a great example of trying to do that. And this is a project led by Justin Reese at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, where he's created a knowledge graph called the COVID knowledge graph. And we've deployed that in the enclave. This knowledge graph contains information about drugs, publications, gene ontology terms, um, diseases, genes, proteins, and phenotypic features, all in, an, in a graph. Um, and then this graph uh, is deployed and can, and can help evaluate the outcomes of the machine learning done on the clinical data to try to identify druggable proteins that interact indirectly with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins. And that helps us analyze drugs that, that may have positive or negative correlations within the N3C cohort. Um, I also wanted to briefly mention um, some work uh, on a website called Outbreak.info, which was also co-funded by the Center for Data to Health that we're leveraging in N3C. Um, and this, this work was, was born to efficiently collect, share, and integrate COVID-19 data that is critical to the mission of analyzing um, COVID-19. And if you recollect at the beginning, you know, we have all these people working really hard to generate lots of different kinds of resources and do science. And it's really hard to figure out what's going on and what kind of resources might be available. Um, and so the outbreak.info um, resource collects information about publications, clinical trials, data sets, protocols, as well as epidemiological information. Um, and this work uh, uh, has led by Chun Li Wu at Scripps uh, Research Institute. Um, and the terrific thing about this for the context of N3C is in particular um, being able to access information about the data set. So having a really robust inventory um, and searchable uh, search engine for bringing in date, public data sets that might be useful in the study of, of COVID-19 clinical data um, is really important. And so we are now deploying um, a search tool that will allow the um, search and selection of in particular data sets related to COVID-19 that a user could then potentially bring in. But I wanted to also mention it because it's, a, it's an open public API. So if you're interested in having um, access for any work that you might be doing on COVID-19, uh, you can query the API and there's information uh, in the slides. Um, before I get too much further, I wanted to talk a little bit about the licensing dependencies, dependencies that check challenge development and deployment. And this is an example from that same translator project, but makes it really challenging for us to deploy these kinds of tools in such an enclave and make them um, fully shared with the community. So in this case, um, there is a tool at the very end of that pipeline called MediCanron. Um, uh, and this is developed by Matt, Matt Mites group at UAB. And um, this tool takes uh, text uh, from the literature, does lexical lookups, syntactic analysis, uses a tool called Metamap, which has a license, another tool called SEMRAP, which has a license. Um, and these are all linked together with the UMLS, which also has many constituent terminologies that each have their different licenses. This is all pushed into a, a database where there are semantic propositions, um, it's basically a knowledge graph created from the literature. And this is pushed into the translator format, which also has its own licenses, and then can be made available to the, to the um, users in the MediCanon tool. We would love to deploy these kinds of tools. There are so many licensing dependencies here that are incompatible that really you know, inhibit our ability to deploy such tools um, in any environment, let alone uh, within the N3C. Um, these are the institutions that have signed on to the data use agreement. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit now about the collaboration aspect, since that's um, one of the um, uh, main themes of our conference today. So we have 130 people from 134 sites that are working together. Um, and they are arranged uh, in part uh, in these, what we call collaborative analytical domain teams. Um, there are many more than are listed here, but again, I just wanted to highlight a few of the questions that different uh, people are asking. So um, for example, um, how effective is convalescent plasma or what endophenotypes exist for um, the childhood disease MISC-C and what are the consequences of that infection? Um, what are the longer term conditions, complications and healthcare utilization and do patients have readmissions? Um, and many other kinds of questions. And so um, uh, on our website, there are, are is a long laundry list of, of domain teams uh, in different areas if you're interested in participating. This is really team science in action. So, over there on the right, um, these domain teams have been populated with experts in the enclave technology in the specific data model and data issues 
um, in the terminologies that are used in the, in the system, in the data quality issues and data missingness and harmonization issues, in the development of code sets and variables and phenotypes and using and parsing N3C data, and in the development and deployment of workflows, methods, and algorithms, as well as machine learning. And because these domain teams have been populated with this expertise, it's this framework on which individual institutions, organizations, and investigators can come in and nucleate those nucleate projects to ask specific scientific questions. And so these domain teams are, are essentially an umbrella organization with providing expertise to individuals who might come in with one kind of expertise, but not in, in the many other kinds of expertise that are needed in order to analyze these really complex and messy data together. Um, and so we're really excited about this notion of these, you know, project nuclei, if you will, um, but being well supported by the community writ large um, that has this really diverse expertise. And so um, I'm sure there are many members of the audience that have uh, expertise that would be valuable to the initiative, and we would very much welcome you to be uh, part of one of the domain teams. This is an example, and I, I wanted to highlight this example, not only because I wanted to thank some of the people on this slide, but also because it really gets after the, um, the really rich partnership model that we have uh, in the N3C between the government uh, at NIH and NCATS in particular, the community, uh, as well as commercial partners. Um, and in this case, um, one of the project teams uh, is populated from uh, members of Novo Nordisk who have really brought um, key pharmacological expertise as well as analytical expertise uh, to their project. Um, clinical expertise from UNC led by John and his trainee, Anna. It's also a great training environment. Um, so the project is really asking uh, key questions about novel anti-hyperglycemic medications um, that have associated cardiorenal benefits and reduced mortality and diabetes and whether or not um, these types of drugs are, you know, good for COVID patients or not so good for COVID patients. And they find it has some really interesting findings that it will be published soon. Um, the folks over there on the right, uh, Richard and Carolyn and Tanner and Steve, Devera, Harold, Stephanie and Janos, are you know, key members of those domain teams that have really made this science go by developing some of those resources, uh, such as the code sets and doing the data harmonization work. Um, so as, as some of you may have heard, um, there have been a number of retractions uh, in the COVID-19 um, fury, if you will. Um, and these manuscripts uh, shown here on the right in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, and in the Lancet were both retracted because there was inaccessible observational data. And this is always a challenge because I mentioned it's really hard to make sensitive clinical data accessible. Um, and in this case, um, they were retracted because all the authors were not granted access. The authors of the paper were not granted access to the raw data and the raw data could not be made available to a third party auditor. And so they were unable to validate the primary data sources underlying the article and these articles were retracted. So I'm here to tell you that we can actually do um, this kind of science uh, on um, sensitive data. We can make data uh, fully reproducible. Um, and so the traceability also, uh, as I mentioned, equals attribution and supports that reproducibility. So um, over there on the left, we have Tiffany Callahan. She's a graduate student at uh, University of Colorado, and she created a really terrific OBO to OMOP mapping file that can be used by many different investigators. And she is linked uh, to that file, which has been deposited in Zenodo. Uh, via her ORCID, as well as a curator role um, from the, the um, contributor role ontology. And over there on the bottom right is just a very high level graph showing the different kinds of people and contributions that are being made to a workflow. Um, and, be, and that tracking then can dump out a file at the other end of all the different people who contributed to any component of the workflow, as well as full reproducibility of that workflow. Um, and so this is what, uh, this is what that looks like. So, um, over here on the left, we have harmonized data from the sites. Um, and these are a bunch of different steps and people that are interacting with that. There's a concept set that I mentioned, maybe it was asthma, maybe it was diabetes. Um, and then uh, over here, we have a medical question. We wanna know something about diabetes, for example. Um, this is the moment we focused only on COVID patients. So this is really important to know how much work got done before we actually only looked at the COVID patients. 
Um, then we generate figures and tables. And then out the other end comes a fully reproducible report that is re-executable to get back to all of this, all the way back to the harmonized data coming back from the sources. So we can, we can actually not only have transparency and make these data available to others who want to validate the results, but the, the entire workflow is fully reproducible. Um, so this just shows some of the connections between people and projects. So uh, for example, here we have Richard, who I mentioned earlier. He's involved in the cohort characterization paper, which is in purple. So that's a project in the system. And that project um, has leveraged the um, body weight um, code set. But that code set was also used in the diabetes and obesity um, project that I mentioned. And so in this way, different groups can share um, resources and also contribute to their evolution over time. So maybe body weight um, gets messier when we bring in more sites. And so we need to um, update it. Um, and so members of both of the projects in this case um, would be um, uh, would be able to take advantage of that improvement over time. And these these are also uh, fully versioned and fully attributed as well. And so coordinating and, and communicating across these three different environments is really challenging. So there's essentially three different communities that um, of, of practice within the, the realm of N3C. So there's the, um, the N3C enclave and clinical data that I spent most of the time talking about. Um, but then there's the N3C community um, as a whole and all the communications that happen. And we've, we've really um, leveraged a large suite of G Suite tools, Slack, um, GitHub integrations, um, ORCID, um, and, and ROAR uh, for the organizational identification. You have no idea how confusing it is to relate people to organizations, um, as well as clinical uh, data to um, clinical organizations and, and who's in charge of the governance of those clinical data. It's, a, it's quite, quite a mess, and we are grateful to ROAR and to ORCID for helping us uh, manage that information. And then uh, pushing all of our archival content all the way to, pub, to pub, for the public use for open access. So all of our governance documentation is pushed to Zenodo. Uh, we'll be re we're releasing our phenotypes and our um, data release notes and all these kinds of things uh, to Zenodo. Um, and so this is just showing um, over there on the left, we have um, 1,235 members uh, of the N3C to date with 313 organizations in 44 states and 14 foreign countries. Um, on the right are just the projects within the enclave. And so this is just showing a sand key of projects, the people involved in those projects and the different institutions that are involved. And so it's a really complex um, collaboration across institutions and people from different places um, and with all of uh, varying expertise. I wanted to highlight for those of you computational folks in the audience that we have a dream challenge. Um, this is led by SAGE by Thomas Schaefer and Tim Burquist. Um, and we have 492 participants in the dream challenge to date. Um, and so if you're interested in computational challenges, um, here are the first question and there are other questions um, is are of patients who have at least one clinical encounter or visit and were who and who tested positive for COVID-19, can we project who will be positive uh, in the future from, from novel data sets or naive data sets? Um, and so it's a really fun activity if you've not participated in a dream challenge and we're uh, really grateful to Sage for uh, launching this initiative. Um, so if you want to register, um, you can go to this link. Um, you go to the Data Enclave. Um, you'll use your uh, single sign-on credentials uh, for your institution. Um, if you're a community member, there's other mechanisms in the system to get involved. Um, so you, we've tried to make it easy for everyone to be involved. Um, and then if you're a returning user, you can log uh, directly into the Enclave. Um, we're kind of arranged into uh, five different work streams, the data partnership and governance work stream. Um, that's a real, that meets twice a week is really active discussion on attribution, publication policies, download policies, uh, ethics around um, trying to collaborate with special communities. Um, it's a very interesting um, set of conversations. The phenotype and data acquisition, which is all about helping institutions get the data into the system. Uh, data ingest and harmonization, which does all of the data cleaning and, and helps support the domain team's uh, understanding of the data quality issues. Our collaborative analytics uh, teams, which are all the domain teams, uh, as well as all the dashboard work um, 
and the deployment of all of the tools in the system, and then our synthetic clinical data uh, work stream, which is working really hard to validate uh, the, the uh, output synthetic data for broad distribution. Um, there's the um, marker paper manuscript, uh, as well as all the links here. Um, and we also have a support desk and office hours uh, for if you get in and you don't know where to go or what to do, we're there to help. Um, I just wanted to quickly make a few uh, acknowledgements, um, especially to Dr. Ken Gersing and Dr. Chris Shute at NCATS and John Hopkins University specifically. They're my two co-leads for the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. Um, uh, Anita Walden, who is the co- uh, or is the assistant director for the Center for Data to Health and has led all the operations uh, for making N3C possible. Uh, Julie McMurray and Moni Munez Torres uh, at Oregon State University on my team who are uh, the gifted wirers of all of the G Suite tooling and uh, um, uh, folks who have uh, really helped the community as well as myself to uh, make all of these visualizations um, look beautiful. Uh, also funding from the NCATS um, uh, NIH Institute uh, and then I just wanted to end uh, on this marker paper uh, that we wrote a few months ago. Um, uh, this is published in Jamia. It's the final print is not actually up because there were so many authors that the journals uh, really been challenged to deploy <laughs> the almost 200 authors that helped write uh, this marker paper. Um, so it really gets after that, uh, you know, it's not just the, the systems that we build for using data and for running code over those data, uh, but also how we share our results and, and publishing systems that aren't necessarily well equipped to allow, um, you know, all of the authors, all of their contributions, all of their ORCIDs uh, to be fully indexed in Medline. And then similarly to include the fully reproducible rep reports that I, that I mentioned. Um, and so, you know, I think this also sort of begs some, some revisiting of how we do large scale collaborative analytics um, and how we can better uh, collaborate with our publishing partners uh, to help make some of these things uh, more robust uh, for everyone to be able to, to leverage. And so with that, I'll, I'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. If anyone wants to send some virtual applause for that. Um, I, I loved, loved hearing you detail so effortlessly the complexity of all of this work as if it was, you know, like no big deal. We had over 1200 people that were participating. Um, and we do have some great questions from the chat. Um, please feel free to keep those coming. I am going to try to get through as many of those as possible um, following up on this. We can take the rest over to Slack. So I'll get started and, and keep those coming in the, in the Zoom chat. Um, one of the, uh, you know, one of the big questions was about the cloud architecture. I know that for, you know, the work that we're doing for, for IOI and in the broader community, there's been a real focus on, you know, the, the technology choices that we, we make in some of this work. And um, the question was particularly asking about, you know, is this based on Palantir Gotham, which I know has a lot of complexities uh, around that too, but I didn't know if you could speak a little bit more about the cloud architecture that you said it was housed over at the NIH. Yeah, and so um, we, we um, it, it's the cloud architecture is, is, is quite uh, complex. And actually, and I, I'm all about attribution is, is led by um, Sam Michaels at uh, NCAP. Um, you know, the, the system itself uh, it combines many different products from many different commercial partners, um, but it, uh, it does leverage uh, a resource. It's not, it's not Gotham, it's um, uh, from Palantir. It's called Unite, and it's a system that was built uh, for NIH that um, essentially allows the secure analytics workflows and is FedRAMP certified. So one of the requirements for deployment was that this would be housed within a an, uh, NIH um, hosted uh, cloud environment that was FedRAMP certified. And so in order to do that in an expedient manner, um, this was the fastest way that, that we could actually launch this environment. Um, there's also a partnership with um, Amazon uh, for the cloud hosting of that environment. Um, and again, these data are all um, managed by NIH. So it's not like Amazon or Palantir or any other commercial organizations have any access to the data other than through the mechanisms that I um, just mentioned uh, through the regular governance model. 
Um, interestingly enough, the um, uh, synthetic data generation machine is on Azure. So we also have a strong partnership with Microsoft and are really grateful for their contributions. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of the, some of the tools that are actually deployed in that environment also comes from, from other commercial organizations. So um, it is really a, a large suite of public private partnerships that have made the creation of this secure FedRAMP certified enclave with the tools that everybody wants to use um, actually uh, work. Um, is that ideal? Um, I think there are many things about that that actually are pretty ideal. I think the pub without the public-private partnerships, we would actually not have been able to do this at the scale or the security that we needed. Um, but at the same time, obviously, we'd really like to um, you know, be able to more easily deploy things in the system. And as I mentioned, many licensing dependencies and other kinds of data dependencies can make that uh, challenging. So. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really pretty complex uh, cloud architecture. And then it's also all overlaying all of that is institutional single sign-on. Um, some of the NIH architecture around that is, is, is in evolution. And um, you know, I think uh, in the actually not too distant future will be uh, even more robust, but uh, for the moment we, we've been um, leveraging the system that NCATS has, has deployed for that purpose. Well, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, another question around governance. So in terms of data governance models that empower patients and individuals, um, you know, thinking about open less, well, open as access, but also open as power. Can you speak a little bit more as to what those data governance models look like, especially on the individual side? You mean for individual patients? Um, yeah, okay. So. Um, in this case, uh, you know, essentially what we, you know, this is, this is a, actually an ethical question more than, it, than it, um, potentially a governance one. So, um, you know, we have done our, our due diligence in trying to balance the, um, you know, privacy and security requirements to collect these data. We have removed all identifiers that are not relevant. Um, and we make everybody get a whole lot of training in order to, to access these data. But we also wanna leverage the expertise of as many people as possible. So finding the right balance um, in that context is very challenging. Um, I think you know, uh, um, using these data, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, there are some institutions that haven't wanted to share these data with us. And you might think that it might be because they're protecting their patients' privacy, but it's actually actually because they want to sell the data to other organizations rather than to give it freely for public benefit. So, so I think when you look at it from that angle, um, you realize that you know, what we're trying to do here is a, a large scale you know, public benefit project and that you know, hopefully the outcomes of which you know, will save a given patient's life or one of their family members' lives. Um, you know, it is um, entirely legal under the current jurisdictions. Uh, so obviously we wouldn't be doing it otherwise, um, uh, but it is, it is challenging to balance those things. I do think that, um, you know, it has, it has uh, really, you know, it has never been done before. Um, you know, are we afraid that something's going to go wrong? Absolutely. We've taken every precaution possible. Um, but uh, I think the fact that we're this far in now and nothing has gone wrong, um, that it, it, it makes it, uh, it makes it feel a lot more plausible that in the long term, we'd have actually have a system in the US where we'd be able to analyze our clinical data for research and for care. Um, by the public for the public, um, which, you know, it shouldn't be only for pharma who or commercial organizations who pay for that data, but actually for everyone who wants to use that data. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's still a lot more work to be done um, to ensure uh, privacy protections um, and, to, and to ensure, you know, I, I would really, you know, and I think this is maybe one of the things that the, the question was getting at, is also like, you know, if you are a patient and you want to see your own data in the system, how can I do that securely and with my own privacy in, in mind so that I can see how I compare to the masses? Um, and maybe I want to push other kinds of data about myself uh, into the system. And so I think those kinds of uh, questions are going to um, really, you know, this, this effort is really going to push on us to start to answer some of those kinds of questions in the longer run. Um, and that gets to, into much stickier governance than, than even what we have now. So I hope, I, hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I've been wondering, 
also just knowing uh, the breadth, the complexity, the scale, and I know we had a question in the chat as well, um, from inception to usable model, like can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how this scaled and, and what sort of timeline you were working on um, in, in terms of bringing in all, I mean, you even just mentioned that for everyone who's engaging with this data, there's training. I could imagine that that in any other context would take like two, three years <laughs> and many things there. So would love for you to kind of share a bit more about your experience and, and what that's been like. Yeah, and I, I do have a timeline slide somewhere and I didn't put that in and now I'm regretting it. Um, uh, you know, it was interesting because, you know, really, you know, right off the bat in like March, we proposed trying to do this and, um, you know, we, we basically, you know, because of our coordinating center that coordinates the 60 clinical institutions sort of said to ourselves, well, what, what can we do that would complement existing community efforts? And, um, and it was because of, again, this is why we're so thankful for this partnership with the four clinical research networks and their clinical data models and all the hard work that they had done uh, beforehand, uh, really partnered with those four networks to be able to create this. So without the work that they had been doing for many years um, with the, within these institutions, um, we wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible. At the same time, you know, conversations with institutions and the community, uh, I think there was a lot of skepticism that this would ever be possible. How many institutions are ever going to sign up for this? And, you know, I think that at the end of the day, um, that there was, you know, there was just a lot of um, kind of uh, iteration between institutions, the community working on, you know, twice a week on these phone calls, iterating on all these documents uh, and NIH is, you know, many facets of regulatory and policy and privacy um, uh, offices going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth across these three different groups uh, until everybody kind of reached some agreement um, that, that they could get on board with. And then once there was a sort of critical mass and we had the first few institutions signing those data transfer agreements, so many just came came pouring after uh, after that, and and you know I I think you know they just sort of told their friends and um, started having members that wanted to participate and started you know kind of nagging our institutional leaders to to participate. And so you know it's again it, it takes a village again like the regulatory people and policy people and security people all kind of working together to create those those data transfer agreements. The other thing that was really critical that was kind of a critical point was originally, um, you know, it's fairly standard to have data transfer and data use agreements all rolled up into one kind of governance framework. Um, and in this case, uh, it turned out, and it was, it was NCAT's idea to separate the two uh, into separate data transfer agreements and data use agreements, which really uh, in hindsight was just brilliant because, I mean, at the time we weren't too happy about it because it made it a lot more complicated and we were worried people wouldn't sign up, but they, uh, it made it actually much more flexible because now institution, a lot more people could participate in the use of the data than from institutions that were contributing. And we have lots of expert um, informatics people that come from institutions that don't have the clinical data to contribute and uh, have their institution signing data use agreements. Um, and so it's, it's kind of changed that landscape and it also helped us tailor those data transfer agreement language to something that the institutions were much more comfortable with because it didn't have everything rolled, rolled together. So um, it took a lot longer so that's the first part of the story. The second part of the story is it took a lot longer to harmonize the data than we realized that it really would. Um, you know, we are only now really, you know, having the first publications being submitted um, for science, right? There's, there's, you know, um, other information out there about the project, but like the actual scientific results took a really long time to come because the data is such a mess, uh, and not not necessarily a mess, but is so you know heterogeneous and variable across sites. Um, and so this is you know I think one of the fundamental findings is that even in the context of the distributed research networks, where it's a well-known problem that data quality and data missingness is an issue, it's much more of a problem when you get all the data in one place in your hands and you're like, oh my goodness, these things are completely incompatible. You have to go back to the individual sites and say, hey, can you give us this differently or, or can you fix this in order to, to generate um, these data differently? And so in the long run, even though it took a lot longer, I think all 
all of the institutions that are participating have learned a lot from the process and hopefully in an even longer run will lift up everybody to be able to generate more consistent data that's more born harmonized or harmonizable uh, for for research use and um, you know I, I would really love to see a US um, clinical data landscape in the future where you know every, all the clinical data is actually generated to be um, anal analyzable um, at a scale of the nation rather than at a scale of the institution which is where we've really been for the past many many decades. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in a few more questions because I know we got about six minutes left. Um, one of the questions from the from the chat, um, is there any synthetic data that's shared before it's fully validated? And what's the equivalent of kind of pre-printing and pre-registering protocols in this environment? Yeah, that's a good question. So the synthetic data is in the system. It is shared. Um, it is not downloadable yet. Um, so um, the validation studies are underway and are going quite well. Um, those should be, um, they've been presented to the public already, so the, the status of them. Um, part of their challenge was, again, that computational environment <laughs> and getting the data, you know, moved from, from one cloud environment environment to the other and then back in again and making sure it was all consistent with the full reproducible workflow um, took quite a lot of, of wiring. Um, but uh, those validation studies are largely focused on scientific validity. So can the data perform the same kinds of analyses uh, for the synthetic data that we can on the de-identified or the limited data set? Um, because the synthetic data generation process involves selecting specific variables and attributes to create the data set, they're they're much you know they're a little bit narrower in focus than the than the original limited data set or the um, or the or uh, or the de-identified data set, um, and so just making sure that those are are useful, those synthetic data are useful, and also getting requirements for the community to. Uh, understand what attributes are most critically important for them in terms of the synthetic data. The other thing that's um, underway is the de-identification um, validation. So making sure that the data can be downloadable is another different type of analysis for a validation that needs to be done. And so um, it's straight. So in terms of like pre-registration, you can go in there now and request access to synthetic data and it will be done in a, in a day or two um, and do it right now. If you want to download, you'll have to wait for that validation um, step for the de-identification. So that's uh, sort of, I guess, the preprint version of the synthetic data is, is that it's available in the system, but you cannot download it until we can finish the de-identification validation steps. Thank you. Um, we have a question about how ORCID IDs or ORCIDs, oh man, you can tell it's late in the day because I just said ORCID IDs. Um, apologies to the ORCID folks on the call. Um, ORCIDs, DOIs, and ROAR fit into your workflows. Yes. Um, so, you know, in the beginning, you know, we, we were trying to, it's really complicated. So first of all, everyone is required to have an ORCID to participate in the N3C. Um, and you know, we hope that their products of their work will all be associated with their, their ORCIDs. Um, we, uh, in the beginning, when we were starting to do the community engagement with the institutions, the um, uh, Centers for Translational Science Award sites, you know, sometimes have one hospital affiliated, sometimes have multiple hospitals affiliated, sometimes the governance over the clinical data doesn't reside in the primary center for translational science, not all of those institutional uh, organizations had ROARs um, and uh, some of them uh, you know, didn't even know exactly what the relationships all were enough to tell us. And so it was very confusing institutional um, landscape. Though, you know, how the funding is distributed is often attached to um, data governance. Um, and I, I think that's a really interesting um, challenge as well. Um, and then um, also the, uh, we leverage the registry within the SMART IRB um, that has institutions registered for managing the IRB. And so um, between the crosswalk of the funding agencies, ROAR and the um, I SMART IRB list, we were able to sort of figure out how to associate data sets with institutions and people with roars, and so now it's mostly all cleaned up. But it was quite uh, it was quite a, a large effort on, on that end, um, and that's what generated that sand key diagram that I that I showed you. Um, and so the and then the workflows for Zenodo are that the um, documents that are uh, intended for public distribution 
are uh, either generated out of the system or just deposited manually into Zenodo with the to get a DUI and uh, associated with the orchids um, in that in that context. Uh, we also um, have our we haven't yet done it yet for the first time. It's going to happen this week, hopefully. Um, when you are generating the reproducible reports, you also will gen you also generate a report of all the contributors and their orchids. Um, and, and we're hoping that we will be able to do that in the format of the contributor attribution model, which would also include their roles that associate each person with each artifact that's used in the reproducible report. And then that would be um, a full list of full contributions. So lots of identifier management on my favorite topic. Perfect. And I've added a couple of those links in, into the chat and to Slack as well. Um, I know we're almost right at the end of time and I want to try to stick to it because I know you can get some great lightning talks afterwards. So my last question for you, Melissa, before I profusely thank you. Given how complex this level of infrastructure, workflows, et cetera, everything that you so beautifully described, do you think it's more likely that these sorts of infrastructures will persist after COVID-19? Um, it's a good question. I think that um, we've learned a lot in developing these, these architectures. Um, I think the things that are going to persist most are the knowledge artifacts, um, the methods, uh, the collaboration and governance strategies, um, and actually, you know, much less the specific technology of the architecture. Um, I think, you know, it, what we've demonstrated is that you can, you know, um, duct tape together a lot of different kinds of architecture um, to make something go if you're in a hurry and it's urgent. Um, and so that's actually, you know, actually says a lot about the community, both the public and the private side, as well as the government side. Um, there's three sides, <laughs> um, but but so so that sort of perspective of um, you know be empowered to do that. The next time we might have to do the next big project, it's gonna that whole landscape's gonna look different. We're gonna know different things about security and cloud computing and size of data sets is gonna be different and hashing strategies are probably gonna be the same, but how we manage them will probably be different. And so all these sort of technology bits will be different in different contexts, but the knowledge gained about, you know, the, the duct tape and the governance and the security aspects, I think, are the, and then, and then just the, the way in which we work together and manage information um, uh, are the things that are going to persist for the long haul. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Handel, for joining us. Um, it is wonderful to see you after all these years, and also thank you so much for helping to um, kick off JROS 2020.